Hello everybody, my name is Jess and I'm here to talk to you today about bushcraft and wilderness skills. There are a number of similar terms for different types of wilderness enthusiasts. Have you ever wondered if you could survive in the woods? I always wanted to, so I've spent a lot of time learning. Wikipedia describes bushcraft as the usage and practice of skills acquiring and developing knowledge and understanding in order to survive and thrive in the natural environment. The term originated in Australia and it's been popularized by people such as Morris Kohansky. He has a really great book that's pretty advanced, but I wanted to show you this one today, if you're ever curious in the future. Different skills are needed to survive a night in the woods or to survive a long time in the woods, although there is some overlap with some of these skills. A lot of bushcraft is making things from the woods just crafting with natural materials. It's super fun. And when you're doing that, it's really important to remember to harvest things sustainably. That might mean no more than one third of the plants from an area or not harvesting the only one or thinking about if you're gonna take a plant from its roots, is that plant going to be able to grow back? And I have these animals here because there are a lot of times when humans haven't done this very well. They haven't really thought about the long-term effects of their harvesting. And they've just taken whatever was convenient or taken too much of a forest or, you know, lots of different stories going on there. But the important thing is we need to do better. We need to remember always to have a good effect on the environment. So have you ever seen a plant called cattail? Not just tails on cats, but a plant called cattail. Sometimes people name plants after something that it made them think of, even though I would say it's a little bit of a stretch. It doesn't look exactly like a cattail, but okay, someone thought it did. So cattail is a really tall plant that grows in wetlands. It actually has a lot of uses because in the right seasons, you can eat shoots, roots, and the pollen. Let me show you a picture from this book. This is my favorite book for the Edmonton area, Edible and Medicinal Plants of the Rockies by Linda Kershaw, it's published by Lone Pine. And in here we have cattails. So this is the pollen, fluffy seeding pollen. And this is what the plant looks like most of the time when it's growing. Also, if you see it because it's a wetland plant, remember that the ground will be wet <laughs> because sometimes I've harvested these roots and just filled my boots <laughs> fully with water. When you're harvesting something that you plan on eating, it's really, really important to go with someone who knows them really well because the young shoots have been confused with poisonous plants like Western blue flag. So cattails can also be used to make quite a few things. I wanna show you some of the things that I've made with them. And the start is this necklace. I made cordage, which is rope, from the cattails, and it's actually quite strong. I've made dolls from cattails. This one is an action figure. I've seen some with skirts, and I've seen some with beautiful hair. I've also made baskets from cattails. These have one type of weave on the bottom and a different type of weave on the sides. I've also made a coil basket. This is the bottom of a coil basket, and this style was used around the world using lots of different types of materials. Some are made from pine needles, some are made from grass. This one is cattails with embroidery thread and sewing thread. So this is like a bushcraft style because it combines natural materials with what's modernly available. There are a lot of different types of baskets. Willow baskets are just bent up plant matter made into something quite solid. Ooh. There are a lot of different styles of willow baskets. This one's taller, so I use it for long, narrow things. There are a lot of different colors of willows, and they can actually require a lot of hand strength to make. 
So in some areas, it was only the men with super strong hands that made the baskets out of willows. This basket is folded up tree bark. This is a traditional sort of pack basket style. It's like a big rectangle cut from the tree bark and then a little half slit at the bottom and fold it up with a rim at the edge for strength and natural materials to tie it all together. To make this basket, I took tree, just took the bark off the tree, hollowed it out, put some animal hide at the bottom, and that's what I use for my knives for the wilderness. There are a lot of different types of knives that are really helpful for different parts of the wilderness. And of course, if you're ever going to use something like that, you need adult supervision. Here's another basket I made that combines willows with modern materials. That's kind of a shortcut because it takes a long time to make the bottom of a basket. And I have some cool things inside of this basket. Deer antler have been used for a lot of different things. They were used to make things like arrowheads, lots of sharp tools, and they were used as the handles for tools. I made a scooping knife uh, with an antler handle and with that blade that scoops you can really get into some more specific areas. I took the scooping knife and hollowed out a gourd that's like a vegetable. Have you ever had butternut squash or something? It kind of looks like that. It's a big vegetable, it dried out, and then I scooped out the inside, filled it up with beeswax, and you can use that to eat from. So that's a traditional style of bowl. And this is kind of the, the start of how you would make a spoon. There's a couple different ways. They were sometimes made with hot coals, and sometimes they were made by scooping out this part and shaping the handle. This is a very advanced style of spoon. Another style of willow basket is the melon basket. This is a great style for collecting mushrooms, especially when people want to keep some mushrooms separate from the other types. Maybe there's something they're not sure about, like, oh, is this the one that I really wanted to take home? It can stay separate. And it's a great way to let mushrooms breathe. Now I wanted to talk about footwear. Footwear in the wilderness is a big deal. There's a lot to know about it. But just thinking of a couple things. I have these boots I really like. They slip on, they're leather, and I wanted to see if they remind you of any sort of traditional type of footwear. Well, to me, they remind me of moccasins. They were a traditional slip-on boot, and these are some ceremonial style, beautifully decorated, beaded moccasins, handmade. And there were different types of moccasins for different areas because there are different needs, different climates, the west coast of Canada is really wet, the uh, middle is really grassy, there's a lot of different factors going on. But I also wanted to show you this wraparound style. So, fold, fold. And then there's this, oh my goodness, lacing. Do you like laces? I mean, really, a lot of my shoes just have velcro or slip on because <laughs> lacing takes some time but 
this is a pretty cool style. In this case, the top part is made from canvas instead of it being all leather. That's a lot cheaper than using all animal hides for a whole boot. So this laces up tight and that becomes a boot. And here is an animal hide. That's the kind of thing that could be used to make a boot. This is uh, more of a commercial tan, but there are a lot of ways that people traditionally tanned animal hides to make them soft and make them ready to become clothing. Have you ever used snowshoes? They're really helpful to stay up high in the snow and not sink. If you've got snow that's up to your hips, it can be really, really handy. Traditional snowshoes are huge, but that helps to spread out your weight across such a big area that nobody sinks. And these are a traditional style, which means that it's partly the shape. They're made of wood on the outside and rawhide here. This rawhide is kind of like leather before it's leather. It's pretty stiff, pretty scratchy. This style of snowshoe uses leather, but also or it uses the rawhide, but also this plastic here, leather for the shoes, and webbing, which is kind of like a plastic rope, as well as this rope and metal eyelets. So it's traditional style, but it's got a lot of more modern materials. Now I think we should take a break and shake it all off, jump around on the spot. Okay. If you were to spend a night outside in the woods, or many nights, what do you think you might need? Especially if it's cold and snowy. Can you think of any of the really, really basic things that you get every day that you need to survive? I would say some of the basics are food, shelter, and water. And you can actually survive for a lot longer without food than you can without water. You really need water. but. Another thing that we're going to really, really need is shelter. And getting all these things can be really complicated, but I wanted to show you a little bit about tarp shelters. One of the principles of bushcraft is to try to carry the least amount of things to make the most happen so that you can be more comfortable in the woods. And so I have a rope here strung up between two trees. A tent peg, but you could also carve a wooden peg, and a tarp that's really small, lightweight, and collapsible. So there are lots of ways in which things can be modified. The rocks can be used to make, um, instead of holes here. There are a lot of different types of tarp shelters, depending on where you are, what the ground is like, what the sun is like, what the wind is like. Sometime after this video, I would love for you to find an adult to help you if you have a tarp, rope, and tent pegs, or you can make tent pegs. And the best style of tarp shelter to start with is an A-frame. Why do you think it's called an A-frame? A. So underneath that, there's a good lot of space to sleep, usually two or more adults, and it's a pretty quick setup. Um, sometimes it gets kind of droopy if the first rope going from tree to tree isn't set perfectly. And there's no ground sheet, which means there's nothing on the ground protecting you. So you, if you were gonna spend a lot of time in there, you'd wanna maybe put another tarp on the bottom. And it can be a little bit crunchy. You can kind of crouch in there, uh, but it's pretty good for when it's raining outside. The plow shelter is a really cool one because it just uses a tree, or in this case we were using a pole that was supporting part of a building, and you take a rope from there and then just peg it into the ground. It's pretty simple and it's great rain, sun, wind protection. It's only open on one side and you can adjust it by putting a stick in the middle and that gives you enough headroom in one spot. 
the uh, downside of it is it's got a little bit less space than the A-frame uh, and it has an open floor too. So if you wanted to make a tent peg um, for soft ground, you can use sticks and you can break them. You know when you break a stick, it's kind of pointy and that's, that kind of works for soft ground, but uh, sometimes it can be really nice to be able to sharpen them. So if someone is old enough and experienced enough to use a knife, they can sharpen it and then push that into the ground. But sometimes tent pegs are really nice, like a good, strong, well-built tent peg that's got a little hook on the end so that your string doesn't pop off. And if you've got ground that's just solid ice, or if your snow is really deep, sometimes it's just, it's harder to set up a tent there. So if you have found an adult to help you, you can write down these names of, or show them this part of the video. Um, these are some names of some nice, simple tarp shelter explanations. Uh, Jason Ecke. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I just found him on YouTube with the plow point. Tarp shelter is a great tarp layout and the classic A-frame tarp shelter. So there are some fancy knots that are helpful for um, getting things really tight and right, but don't worry too much about getting them really, really tight. Just try to make the basic shape and one of the downsides if you don't do quite the right knot is that it can tighten up when you're tightening up the shelter. So bring a cutting tool with you just so you make sure that you're not littering any bits of rope, sticking them onto a tree and not able to get them undone again. In a real emergency situation, something else could be made into a tarp like a garbage bag. So rope is really, really important because rope gives you shelter amongst other things. And there's a type of rope called paracord. This one's really, really cool. I don't know if you've seen my fire making video, but this one has waxed cord on the inside of the paracord. So that is a good fire starter. And then the cord itself is quite strong. So that gives you two advantages. if You slice off just a little bit of this, and then you start making your shelter with the rest of the rope. I wonder if you've heard about what happens when you eat snow? You know what I always heard is that snow dehydrates you, so it means that you would be actually losing your body's water by eating snow, but you know what snow is made of? It's water, but it's cold. It's really cold. So if you put that in your mouth, your body actually has to work to warm it up. And that's the reason that eating a lot of snow isn't a good idea, because if your body needs to warm it up, then you're losing your body's heat. But we could eat a little bit. If we know the snow came from a good, clean spot, you know, the down eat yellow snow. Hmm. Pretty good, actually. Thanks for joining me. I hope you've learned some things. Have fun.